Is that better? Okay. So it is my very distinct pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker, Dr. Charles Lee. Dr. Charles Lee currently serves as director of the Medical Genetics Research Unit at Brigham and Women's. He's also director of the Cytogenetics Laboratory at the Cancer Center of the Dana-Farber, and he is an associate professor at Harvard. Dr. Lee did his PhD in medical sciences at the University of Alberta, and then he postdoced in molecular cytogenetics at Cambridge University and then at Harvard. He joined the faculty of Harvard in 2001, and it's been a very steep, I would say, sloped <laughs> to your career since then. Um, critical to his research were his seminal findings that were published in a Nature paper in 2004 that described the structural, large structural variation in the human genome. He has since really been a founder of this field of understanding the relevance, the etiology, the mechanisms of structural variation as they apply to human disease, both inherited and both in cancer. He has, and for his work in 2004 and his continuing work in the field, he received the HOAM Prize in Medicine. It's the, essentially the Korean equivalent of the Nobel. It was given, he was the youngest person ever to receive that award. In 2012, he received he became a Chen Global Investigator for the International Human Genomics Organization and a fellow in 2012 for the American Association of the Advancement of Science. And he is on the steering committee of the Thousand Genomes Project and many, many other um, collaborations where he serves as an expert consult to the FDA, the CDC, etc. He has really over 100 publications most of them in very top journals. You're looking at Nature and Cell. They really, each of these pieces of work has made major advances to the field. And although when I asked Charles to speak here, he was at Harvard, and he still is, until <laughs> August 1, <laughs> because there was a press release on Monday that announced that Charles has been uh, selected to be the scientific director at the Jackson Lab for Genomic Medicine or the Jack's Genomic Medicine uh, Institute. And Edison Liu, who's the uh, CEO and president of Jackson Lab, made the following comment about Charles Lee. He said, Dr. Charles Lee is uniquely qualified to lead our entire effort around the clinical implication of genomic medicine. He represents the next generation of scientific leaders in translational science with national and global recognition. And so it's truly an honor. I am very glad I asked you early in the year <laughs> um, uh, to have him here. And he will be talking to us today about his work in structural variation. I've had uh, <clears throat> introductions in the past, but I think that outdoes every introduction I've had so far. <laughs> Betsy, you're wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Thank you for this uh, kind opportunity to be with you here today. Um, I was actually fine about giving this presentation. I, I, I give a fair number of talks over the years, so I was actually fine with doing this until I was told about three minutes ago that I'm going to be evaluated uh, online, so please be kind. And now I'm, like, I'm getting a heart palpitation, but this is not good. Not a good way to start. Um, so I will... Um, I, I, I do want to say, to start off, that um, I am very grateful for this opportunity. It's my first time here at the University of Minnesota, and um, there's a lot of this place that reminds me of what I think about as home. I grew up, actually, in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and I think the mannerisms of the people, um, just the environment, um, it, I, I do feel very comfortable, and I do want to thank you, uh, Betsy, and your colleagues for providing that, uh, this opportunity for me today. Today's talk, um, as um, is up here on the board, is Understanding Human Diseases Through Structural Genomic Variation DNA Sequence. And this is an area which I could, um, I love passionately and I could talk for hours, but I'll try to keep it under an hour. In another way, um, another way of looking at it, uh, this is a topic that 
title that I use sometimes for my talk is Towards Sequencing Everyone's Genomes. So uh, as Betsy mentioned, I am, uh, I've been at the Brigham Women's Hospital uh, in Boston for the last 12 years. Um, and um, a little sad to be leaving it uh, in, a, in a couple of months. Uh, it's been a wonderful institution. Uh, in particular, I've, as, um, uh, I've been in the Department of Pathology there. We've been very proud about our uh, outreach uh, and our contributions to, uh, to education. Uh, many of you in the audience will know this, uh, what we refer to as the Bible of uh, Pathology, which started off uh, in our department uh, with Robin Scotran uh, and others, and, and I think it's in their eighth or ninth edition now. Um, as I myself am a cytogeneticist, I've uh, done both clinical and research cytogenetics, um, and my career uh, probably started back in 2001. This is a photo of my group a couple years later. Um, I was very fortunate over the years to have a lot of uh, fantastic students, and in particular, uh, this one gentleman I'm going to highlight to you here, just to give you a little bit of background of the work that we've been doing. This is John I. Frady. Uh, he was my second postdoctoral fellow, uh, come from trainings at Yale and, at, um, and from uh, Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, he wanted to understand where we can take new technologies and, and apply it into the clinical and the pathology realm. Um, and he, being as smart person as he is, he knew the background of, uh, of what we knew about the human genome. Uh, in particular, one of the things that he knew is that uh, he, he and others had been taught the fact that if you take two normal, healthy individuals, um, and you don't make jokes at the FDA, by the way, about the presidents. I found this out. <laughs> I tried them one time. <laughs> Dead silence the whole room. <laughs> So um, we, we were taught that the, um, if you look at two normal healthy individuals, that uh, the genetic similarity between these two individuals are on the order of 99.9%. Uh, and the differences were in the form of what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms, essentially spelling mistakes in the book of life, single base pair changes. Uh, and so that was a dogma that had been, uh, both John I. Frady, myself, and others up to about 2004 had understood. And so when he was doing these, as a good scientist, doing these control array CGH experiments, looking at one human genome with another, both healthy, he expected to see profiles like this. He Because these array CGH experiments really picked up large gains and losses throughout the genome. He expected to see a flat profile. Um, where you basically see a little bit of noise, but otherwise no gains and losses for every chromosome in the human genome. Every time he did this uh, experiment, these are kind of the results that he saw, where he saw what looked like either very noisy data or actually true gains and losses for every chromosome uh, throughout the genome. And after looking at 55 different pairs of individuals, we were pretty convinced that this is probably not a, um, a technical issue. Uh, we were able to validate about 25% of these, uh, but this was in fact a real biological phenomena uh, occurring in the human genome. And so as Betsy had mentioned, we uh, published this in Nature Genetics uh, back in 2004, uh, and within a week of that time there was a pa another paper that came out from Cold Spring Harbor, uh, basically coming to the same conclusion. They were also doing array CGH experiments and found these large gains and losses in the human genomes of healthy individuals. So this is now what we refer to as copy number variants, or uh, which refer to DNA segments that are present in variable copy number comparing one uh, reference or uh, genome to another. Now how many of these CNVs do we have in each one of us? Um, the, the data that we have from the late, probably about two years ago from high resolution array CGH experiments are that we easily have if we look at copy number variants that are 500 base pairs in size or larger, more than a thousand of these. And in fact, it varies in number. Uh, if you're from a European population, uh, you, the median number that we got is about 1117. Uh, African populations have more genetic variability, and hence in this case we found uh, them to have median numbers of uh, upwards of 1400 uh, per individual. But when you compare two genomes with one another, uh, we found that approximately 0.78% of the genomes, or about 24 megabases of DNA, actually differed with respect to copy number variation. So that's quite a number, a large amount of DNA variation that had not been previously understood, 
and is way above the 0.1% difference that we get from single nucleotide polymorphism. So this is a substantial amount of genetic variation we find in normal individuals. So this concept of 99.9% .9 similarity between two normal individuals uh, is really out the door now. And based on the data that we have from mainly copy number variants and a few other balanced rearrangements, other structural variants, uh, we estimate that, in fact, genetic similarity between two normal individuals is around 98.7 to 99.1 percent, so a magnitude less uh, than what we knew previously. And, of course, what's important about these CNBs is although we find them in normal healthy individuals, they are associated or, with either certain human diseases or increase our risk uh, or susceptibility to human diseases. Many of us in the field know now that a lot of neuropsychiatric disorders are associated with these CNBs. Uh, autoimmunity, uh, we found the paper came out in 2006, showed that this particular gene, FCGR3, uh, is uh, normally in four copies per individual, but if you have a deletion of one copy, that will lead to, uh, results in hyperactive macrophages that leads to an immune response uh, associated with systemic <coughs> uh, lupus patients. A really nice story came out in two papers in 2006-2007 on beta defensins. These are small secreted microbial, antimicrobial peptides that range in copy number from 2 to 12 per individual, at least in the Europeans that have been examined, with a median number of 4. If you have less than 4 copies of these beta defensins in your genome, you tend to have this breakdown of the antibacterial uh, barrier that's in the intestinal wall. And this breakdown is thought to lead to inflammation that's associated with Crohn's disease. So the idea here is that if you have not enough of this particular gene, then you have uh, a decrease in uh, the antibacterial barrier, and therefore, logically, more copies should be better for you. That actually is not necessarily the case. Uh, a, a subsequent study actually showed that if you had higher than four copies of beta defensins in your genome, uh, you've started to increase your susceptibility to psoriasis, and this is thought to be due to activation of the uh, EGFR stat signaling pathway. Um, and again, the, the idea here being that in a lot of these cases, probably there isn't uh, an absolute uh, uh, copy number, um, ideal copy number of a particular gene per genome, but there's this sort of an equal ideal equilibrium, so if you have too much or too little of something, uh, that can really lead to various human diseases. But of course, now we're into, as, as all of you know, uh, this new technology which is just rampant and, and really uh, becoming part of every facet of medicine now, as in whole genome sequencing. Uh, as Betsy mentioned, I uh, have been involved in the uh, Thousand Genomes Project for the last four years. Um, on the steering committee, and, and more in particular, uh, helping to co-chair the structural genomic variation component of it. Uh, but it's been fun to watch how this uh, international project has um, come about and has proceeded. I do remember in the earlier discussions, uh, when we started this project up, there was a heated debate on whether or not the samples that we were going to whole genome sequence for this thousand genomes project and make available to the entire scientific community whether or not they should be linked with phenotypes or they shouldn't be linked with phenotypes. And I, I'm pretty sure there was about 40 minutes of heated discussion between Francis Collins and Eric Lander uh, about this particular topic. Francis being very adamant that it's going to be difficult to get uh, IRB approval to associate any phenotypes with this, and the best way is to, to hide or not disclose any of the phenotypes of the individuals being sequenced. Of course, Eric Lander, which in his right was correct, he is adamant about the fact that, no, I want all the clinical information and phenotypic information about these individuals so we can get a jump start on associating various uh, variants with the particular phenotype. And he was also correct as well, uh, but a little bit ahead of his time. And so it was decided that, in fact, there would be no phenotypes with these individuals, and the Thousand Genomes Project started. The goal initially for the Thousand Genomes Project was, as I mentioned, to build a resource to help understand the genetic contribution to disease, to provide a comprehensive catalog of genetic variation, single nucleotide polymorphisms, indels or in small insertion deletions, and structural variants uh, through whole genome sequencing at a population level. Uh, initially, it was 
supposed to be a thousand individuals, but as sequencing got cheaper and we were able to do more, this number has now increased to 2,500 individuals across 29 populations. Uh, the, idea, the plan was to find most genetic variants that are over 95% in sequence, uh, over 95% of the genetic variants that had a frequency of at least 1% in the population study. Uh, so we're really looking at common variants here, not uh, low frequency or private variants. And two papers have been, main papers have been published so far. Uh, one was based on work done in 2008 to 2010, uh, which was published in 2010 in Nature. Uh, and the second paper uh, just recently came out uh, in 2012, uh, looking at uh, the first 1,092 human genomes based on work that was done uh, in phase one from 2010 to 2012. So just to give you an update on sort of what these, uh, these phases were. So for the pilot project, um, basically it involved uh, 100, almost 180 individuals that were sequenced at low coverage uh, depth, uh, so two to six X coverage. Three quarters of it is Illumina sequencing, some solid, and then four by four sequencing. And then we had two trios that we looked at, one European trio, one African trio, uh, again, with similar proportions of technology sequencing, but at a 42x mean coverage. This data was also supplemented by exome sequencing, about 50x sequence coverage across 697 individuals from seven populations. Uh, what did we find out from the pilot project? Well, a lot of uh, SNPs were discovered, 15 million in particular. 1 million insertion deletions were identified and 22,000 uh, uh, larger deletions were identified. For the structural variants, we also provided additional information which um, people could access, uh, which were relatively, uh, we thought were, uh, um, we were pretty positive that those are, um, are true structural variants, but uh, did lack a thorough validation that I'd like to have seen. But it, bottom line is we uh, had listed about 500 tandem duplications, more than 5,000 mobile element insertions, and then 174 novel insertions. Um, there was actually, because the structural variation uh, component of the 1,000 Genomes Project was quite in-depth with a lot of new uh, uh, computer algorithms and analyses, uh, the, the, the the information from the 1000 Genome Pilot Project was actually published in a second paper uh, that, uh, that came out. So the Structural Variation Analysis Group, just to let you know how much work has gone into uh, analyzing this data just from one uh, angle uh, of analysis. So we actually have 51 scientists around the world that gather together. Not everyone gets onto the calls, but together we work and we have weekly conference calls for one hour to analyze the data and go over what, uh, uh, what are the following uh, projects that need to be done. And this encompasses 17 institutions. So structural variants that we are looking at, we're looking at deletions, we're looking at duplications, looking at insertions of sequences, uh, mobile element insertions, and then uh, other structural variants that are balanced, such as uh, inversions. Now, structural variant analysis and whole genome sequencing data is not actually as straightforward as just looking for SNPs. Um, for those of you that know DNA sequencing, nowadays we are doing what's called paired end sequencing, where you take your DNA sequence, you share it, you adapt, uh, you ligate adapters to it, you anneal those to a, a glass surface, and then you perform your synthesis, DNA synthesis in one direction and then in the other direction. And what this essentially does is it yields to you pairs of DNA sequences that actually represent sequences that are coming in from each side of a particular DNA fragment. These uh, pairs of sequences are then mapped back to the human genome, reference genome. And of course, this is going to hang up on me. Uh, when you have a DNA library of a given size here, in this case, it's about DNA library of about 140 bases in size, you basically expect uh, these pairs of sequences to map back to the reference genome uh, with 140 base pair of uh, spacing. So this would be an example of an expected result. 
uh, when you map back these sequences, sometimes, <coughs> apologize about this, sometimes they actually uh, map back uh, further away from each other than what's expected. That's a deletion, that's an insertion, and even the orientation of these uh, pairs of sequences are informative. Normally these uh, sequences should face one another like this, but if they're going in the same direction, that is potentially indicative of uh, a site where uh, a balance rearrangement has occurred and that's one of the breakpoints uh, involved. So that's paired end sequence analysis. Uh, there's another uh, analysis that can be done called split read analysis where these same sequences when they're mapped back to the genome, occasionally you actually get a break in one of those uh, pairs, uh, one of those sequence reads. So that actually would represent a deletion, and, and this particular result would represent a, an insertion. So what's nice about the split read analysis is when you actually get data like this, you actually get breakpoint uh, sequence data back for, uh, for this particular structural variant. Many of you will know read depth analysis. This is probably one of the most commonly used uh, type of analysis for structural variants. Basically, you sequence the genome at a given coverage, let's say 40x coverage. If you have regions that have less than the expected 40, uh, X, uh, 40 reads, that would potentially represent a deletion. If you had regions that had actually more than that, that would represent a potential duplication uh, for that sequence. And finally, we have these uh, regions of the genome that, um, where we can get these paired reads that actually produce a contig that will come together, and the ends of these contigs will actually overlap with uh, parts, the ends of gaps that are in the genome. And that's what we call sequence assembly. So what did we learn from the pilot project? Well, we learned that uh, we do need to do a lot of extensive experimental validation. Uh, whole genome sequencing is at a stage where a lot of calls are being made, uh, and um, there's still a, lot, a significant number of errors that are being uh, made for the variant call, even more so for structural variants if you don't have uh, a complementary experimental validation that goes alongside. Uh, and we also, um, for method developments, uh, the power uh, for discovering these genetic variants can actually become increased when we combine different sources of information from different types of algorithms, and also by combining information across genomes if we were to get population-based uh, variant calling. So after the pilot project was done, we moved into phase one. Uh, so the phase one data summary, uh, we sequenced 1,092 individuals from 14 different populations at low coverage, two to six X coverage, as well as exome targeted sequencing, given as 38 million SNPs. 1.4 million indels, and 14,000 deletions. Now, what was different about, of course, it was important for, I'm being very frank here, but it's just, it was very important for the Thousand Genomes Project when they put out a paper. It's got to hit the top tier journals. If it doesn't hit nature or science, uh, they consider themselves a failure. So it, it was actually at a stage where they had to discuss and think very clearly about, okay, what is it new about this 1,092 individuals that we're studying? Uh, that we can get it into a high-impact journal. And so they figured that, well, in the pilot project, we just listed the variants. Now we should be in a stage where we can actually integrate those variants in what is referred to as haplotypes. Basically, we want to know what, what single nucleotide polymorphisms, what copy number of variants, what indels exist on the same chromosome uh, for in each individual. And so a lot of analysis was done to integrate these genetic variants into haplotypes. Uh, and also to provide genotyping information, whether it's in this case 0, 1, 2 copies uh, for a particular variant, uh, and to provide the information uh, with probabilistic haplotype estimation uh, to the general community. We did our best, uh, but it, and, it, and it reads very good in the paper, but um, it's important to read the small print, and, and the small print is that in this particular study, the phasing errors that is, what uh, the, this haplotyping that we're doing here, we estimate uh, that the phasing errors is actually occurring approximately once in every 400 kilobases. So that's a thousand times, or close to a thousand times per genome. So we still have a lot ways uh, further to go to make this uh, a better 
uh, annotation of the human genomes. False discovery rates, uh, not too bad. Uh, for SNPs, we estimate about 1.8% false discovery rate. Uh, when you have some exome data, it's about 1.6%. Indels, they conservatively estimate about 5.4%. Uh, but to be honest, I actually think that number is higher. Indels, surprisingly, are very difficult to identify. And uh, about 5%, more like probably between 8-10% for large, uh, less than 5% for large lesions, but about 8-10% to for other structural variants. We've been getting better as time goes on in identifying uh, the variants in the, in the genome, in more particularly to assess, to, uh, to assess the variants in parts of the genome. For the pilot project, uh, using HGA team, we estimated that we were only capturing variants in about 89% of the genome. And for phase one, that's increased now to 94% for HG19. So where, what's the final step? So we're actually, the, the project for the Thousand, Thousand Genomes project will be ending this year, uh, at least for the SNPs and the indels. Um, and we will have all 2,500 samples have actually now all been collected. And uh, I believe all of them have now been sequenced. So we're in the analysis phase right now. So um, we're expecting an, at least 3x coverage for all those individuals. Uh, and um, and higher coverage for the exomes of the sequences, and of course expanding into 11 more populations, including Af in Africa, uh, Asia, and the Indian subcontinent. Uh, so this is sort of the timeline uh, for the completion of the project, and we're hoping for integration and data release uh, November to December of this year. This just represents 27 populations across 2,000 uh, for the 2,500 individuals. And um, what is it providing? Of course, uh, everyone, uh, it, everyone around the world has now access to this large public database of next generation sequencing data. Uh, we have well-defined catalogs of genetic variants, uh, which can be used for understanding candidates for functional effects, natural polymorphisms for medical sequencing and screening, uh, foundation for imputation of unknown genotypes, and then the baseline data for population genetics. A lot of tools, I can't stress enough that a lot of tools have actually been developed, uh, computer algorithms, etc. now analytical methods to analyze genomic sequences, and those are actually being incorporated in, uh, in sites that are now starting to do next generation sequencing uh, for, uh, for clinical purposes. This is just a URL for some of those sites. I've left a copy of the presentation uh, here so you can access this if uh, you like. So, um, of course, with the clinical uh, background that I have, um, one of the things that I continue to ask myself is, well, what is the impact of these new technologies, and in particular, uh, next generation sequencing in clinical genetic diagnostics? Um, and so, in the clinical side of the lab at the Brigham, of course, we have sort of three areas, as you do here, of uh, areas that we do um, diagnostic testing for, so prenatal, constitutional or postnatal, and cancer. Uh, for prenatal diagnosis, of course, we can get our samples from uh, chorionic villi sampling or amniotic fluid sampling. Um, I was talking with Betsy actually last night, and we're, we're quite amazed at how much our uh, prenatal volume has decreased because of uh, non-invasive prenatal diagnosis testing. And that's, the, that's, the, that's what happens with progress. Um, we have, uh, over the last year, been performing a race CGH for prenatal diagnosis, uh, more on a limited basis. It hasn't been, uh, we're not doing this really for every case, uh, but in particular, we're focusing on cases where there's high risk uh, of the uh, family history of concern, uh, ultrasound findings. Um, and in this, this is just one example of how our report comes out. Uh, this is a 180K uh, array CGH uh, that we designed at Brigham Women's Hospital which shows from the profiles from chromosome 1 all the way down to 19, 20, 21, 22, X and Y. And what you can see here, this is a sex mismatched uh, sample, so you can actually see the gain of the X chromosome loss in Y material. Uh, so that is actually not, we're not worried about that. This here, we actually find an abnormality of a gain, in fact, a 2.5 megabase gain on chromosome 22, a blow up of this region, 
shows what it looks like. Each dot represents an olive oil on the array, and you see this clustering of olive oil that has been shifted up significantly uh, in this uh, region on chromosome 22. And of course, you zoom in, and you find out that, in fact, there is three copies of 86 genes in this region, uh, in this uh, individual uh, this fetus uh, that's, undergo that's in the pregnancy. But like any technology, um, there's limitations, and we all know that uh, one of the limitations for RACGH is that it cannot detect balance rearrangements. Uh, and unless there's some gains or losses that are near the breakpoints, but um, technically it's not designed to pick up balance rearrangements, just at imbalances. And that's actually important for the cytogeneticists because we know from previous estimates that in fact uh, there is a significant risk of serious congenital anomalies associated with balance chromosomal rearrangements, Dorothy War version back in 1991, empirically uh, uh, derives the fact that 6.1% of de novo uh, chromosome, uh, balanced chromosome rearrangements uh, that are found in the prenatal setting, 6.1% uh, of those translocations, and 9.4% of those inversions actually are associated with serious uh, congenital anomalies. And so our you know, hopes now are that with next generation DNA sequencing, uh, this clinical cytogenetics lab can now start to be poised for high throughput detection, localization, and characterization of balance rearrangements, what, or what we refer, what we like to call precision prenatal diagnosis. And it's very scary, uh, but we're trying to uh, get more experience in this area. Let me give you a couple of examples that have gone through the lab so far. Uh, this is case number 239, where uh, a 30-year-old uh, has come in with a history of infertility, G2C0 FAB1 following in vitro fertilization. Uh, she had normal first trimester screening, but then at 19 weeks starts to see abnormal, uh, ultrasound abnormalities, uh, including tricuspid atresia, hypoplastic right, right ventricle. 27 weeks, polyhydramnios was noted, uh, and was, they weren't able to find the stomach for the fetus. At 33 to 35 weeks, they started to notice flex extremities protruding upper lip, micromachia, and undescended testes. So a host of uh, ultrasound abnormalities that really make you worry about this fetus. Uh, by cytogenetics, routine cytogenetics, we found, in fact, this fetus had a balanced translocation, or what we think is a balanced translocation, between chromosome 6 and chromosome 8. So that's great. Conventional cytogenetics, we can identify the breakpoints by the chromosome band. Chromosome 6 at band 213, chromosome 8 at band 213, but really this is not as satisfying anymore given the fact that we have next generation sequencing technology available to us. So this is a de novo rearrangement found in the fetus, was not found in either parent. Um, I think that we checked paternity testing. I don't know what it's like here, but in Boston, paternity, non-paternity is about 8 to 10 percent for patients coming to clinic. So you, you have to, IBM, sorry? Not yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> not an idea. Good point. So with next generation DNA sequencing now, uh, we actually uh, can precisely break, uh, identify where these breakpoints are. Um, and so we did so in this particular case. We found out that one of the breaks, the one in chromosome 6, uh, broke a gene called lmbr 0 b one which uh, doesn't have a lot of function to it, so there's not a lot we can say about it, because uh, so, we really don't know a lot about this particular gene. Um, but the other break actually broke a gene called CHD7. And CHD7 is well known to be associated with a, disease, uh, a syndrome called CHARGE syndrome. And so we predicted that, in fact, this child and the, the abnormalities that we're seeing in the ultrasound uh, were consistent with CHARGE syndrome, uh, the parents' uh, and actually, this baby was, uh, I think, was spontaneously aborted afterwards, um, so it didn't continue the pregnancy. But with prenatal, uh, precision prenatal testing, the, the, the biggest issue is that we have a, approximately a two to two and a half week window where we need to take the fetal DNA, we need to make the DNA libraries, we need to actually do the sequencing, we need to do all the computational analysis, and then identify uh, the breakpoints in a very timely manner. And, uh, and this has been actually quite a challenge, uh, and, the, and we're still trying to uh, 
to make, get this a little bit better. But in this particular case, we were able to go from the fetal DNA all the way to breakpoint sequence analysis in approximately 14 days. Second case, uh, I'm actually going to present to you as a video. This is a case of this particular lady who uh, came to clinic. She, we did, she came in because of advanced maternal age, uh, and we found, in fact, cytogenetically, her child had an inversion, a de novo inversion. Um, so she's actually Italian. Her, her husband is Korean. I, I'm not the father. Um, <laughs> um, and, then, and then they had this inversion that was um, found in the fetus. Uh, so obviously very anxious about um, you know, what that means to the baby. We, see, we actually sequenced through the breakpoint, found out that it didn't intersect any genes. That doesn't necessarily mean that the baby is in the clear, but at least we can give the patient a little bit more reassurance that from what we can get from the data available, you know, we're a little bit more hopeful that the baby will be uh, uh, normal. And so the baby was actually born, it's very gratifying, and in fact she has said that um, without this information she most likely would have terminated the, the pregnancy. So let me just see if this will actually work. We're not getting sound. We found out that uh, the baby had a chromosomal inversion. And the team here at Brigham was really amazing because they offered, first of all, a lot of support. And then uh, they gave us access to a lot of uh, testing possibilities, including a new methodology that Dr. Morton's lab was uh, just uh, developing. If we were not here, we were in some other place. Most likely, Julian would not be born. And we felt really lucky of having the possibility of getting access to this testing. <coughs> So of course we use this for our Brigham and Women's promotional uh, materials. This is a great story. Um, what else can we do for next generation sequencing? So of course, as I mentioned, in the clinical cytogenetics arena, we do look at prenatal sampling. One area that we're starting to get into now is newborn screening. Uh, and this is a fascinating area. We all know that uh, for whenever we have, actually we don't all know this. Um, when we have a child, um, at some point, the child is whisked away, and they do uh, these, they, they prick the heel of the child, and of course put some blood on these guthrie cards uh, to do um, mass standard, uh, kind of sex uh, testing uh, for various metabolic disorders. So this is what we refer to, as, uh, as you know, newborn screening. But what's interesting is that I've gone through three, I've gone through, I've had three kids uh, so far, and I don't, <laughs> And I don't recall ever uh, being told, uh, they may have told us, but I don't recall actually having been told that we're going to take your baby out now to have this newborn screening done. You know, at one point you, the baby's gone, and then at some point you notice when you're picking up the baby that there's a little, you know, blood spot or something on the heel, so you know it's happened. Um, but it, I, I'd be, uh, I'm sure that a lot of um, non-clinical, non-medical uh, parents uh, probably are very unaware that all this is going on behind the scenes. Well, so we have um, begun very, it's very recent, uh, in the last actually month and a half, we've begun this program project, which is called Seekaboo, uh, sequencing a baby for optimal outcome. And so um, the idea here is that um, newborn screening, of course, is done uh, pervasively, it's performed on 4 million U.S. infants per year, uh, and we want to investigate the role of DNA sequencing in, in, in newborn screening. We can't do everything, we have to start somewhere. So the pilot project that we're doing is we're focusing on two specific uh, congenital anomalies as models for the use of genome sequencing for newborn screening, congenital, congenital hearing loss, and then congenital heart disease. So it's amazing to remind ourselves that in fact, Deafness, congenital hearing loss, is the most common sensory de deficiency in humans. One in every 500 newborns uh, are diagnosed with hearing loss. CHD, or congenital heart disease, is the next, or, or is also the most common form of human birth defect, uh, and CHDs are actually occurring in about 48 uh, uh, babies per 1,000 live births. Why did we choose these uh, particular uh, syndromes? So the, the criteria was that both are characterized by a lot of genetic heterogeneity. Uh, it was important that we understood which specific mutation actually exists. 
This would inform us a little bit more of the nature, severity, and the course of the disease. Uh, and this would also then inform us on different strategies for management. We know that hearing loss and congenital heart disease uh, are also associated with various syndromes, which may not be evident right at the beginning. And therefore, if we identified the mutation, found out that it was linked to a particular syndrome, that would actually provide us with crucial information for other organ systems that should be worked up in that particular child. <coughs> Because of the heterogeneity, we really expect that new genes and mutations would be discovered, and that's very important for, of course, keeping up publication records uh, and just to expand our understanding of genetics, uh, medical genetics. Uh, and most importantly, these, uh, our intentions are that the results from this study will actually be returned to the parents and physician, uh, allowing them to, of course, uh, provide early and appropriate intervention. So. The update right now is we've actually had our, uh, we've already gone through our first uh, CHD case, uh, which was detected in the prenatal setting, um, and we did exome sequencing for the child. We found uh, uh, three uh, potential mutations. Uh, we had the mothers, but of course we don't have the fathers, so we actually don't know if it's been over yet, but we're sort of working through the kinks as we speak right now. Finally, cancer genetic diagnosis. Uh, and uh, this is where I get to sort of boast about my up-and-coming new position. Uh, so as you know, the Jackson Labs, uh, which was started back in 1929, is world famous for its ability to both do mouse genetics and to provide uh, mouse uh, models of human diseases uh, to the greater scientific community. Well, as of this year, um, they, the Jackson Labs is actually expanding beyond Bar Harbor, Maine, and in Farmington, Connecticut, on the, on, um, uh, on the site of where the University of Connecticut Health Science Center is, uh, next to it, uh, they are actually building this structure, which is going to be called the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine, a uh, freestanding institute uh, that will initially be, uh, will have 30 principal investigators and a total of about 300 people, and hopefully within 10 years doubling in size, all for uh, investigators that want to uh, focus and provide service for uh, cutting-edge uh, genomic uh, medicine. Uh, I love these artists' re renderings. So this is what it's supposed to look inside once it's done, just in the lobby. This is the lab areas, which are connected to uh, computational um, uh, people. And most importantly, you have regions where you can sit and have coffee and just chat uh, about your experiments or your day-to-day -day activities. The flagship project for, and one of the reasons why I decided to um, take up uh, this new position at the Jackson Labs um, is for a couple reasons. So one is, this is an institute that is actually Connecticut-wide, uh, so I actually will have cross appointments with Yale, University of Connecticut, and other institutions. But to bring them all together to do state-of-the-art genomic analysis for the state of Connecticut and, and potentially later on beyond. And one of the flagship projects that uh, we are starting to get into right now is this thing called mouse avatars for cancer therapy. Simply put, uh, what we want to do is we want to be able to take patients that come in with uh, initial with solid tumors, uh, and we haven't quite defined yet which uh, solid tumors we'd start off with, but we would come in, uh, the patient would come in from the hospital, uh, patient would come to the hospital, have surgical reception done, we would receive that particular tumor se specimen. Part of that would undergo deep sequencing and bioinformatic analysis for the purpose of trying to identify what uh, inhibitors would work specifically for that person's tumor. Uh, and then, on the other hand, with the rest of the tumor, we'd actually be taking the rest of the tumor, putting them into uh, immunocompromised mice, uh, just subcutaneously, and then taking the inhibitors that we've identified bioinformatically here uh, and testing them in these mice to see which of these inhibitors will actually, in vivo, cause that tumor to shrink. Uh, and then uh, this whole process can be expected to take about two to two and a half months, but then while the patient is undergoing standard, uh, standard uh, uh, treatment, after about two, two and a half months, we would be able to approach the patient with the oncologist and advise them that we've done this. Of course, they wouldn't know that because they'd have to sign off on it. 
but let them know what the results are for, uh, for this work and tell them potentially that there are one or two or a couple of uh, inhibitors which are not standard care treatment, but we have strong evidence that would actually this would be uh, therapeutic for that particular patient. So this is just a shot of uh, when the tumor is put into solution and, and injected subcutaneously in the mouse. Um, you can see here uh, where the tumors are in the mice and growing, and then these mice then would be subjected to the various inhibitors that we uh, determined bioinformatically would be good for that patient's uh, tumor. Now, uh, there is a pilot project going on in one of your, uh, at the Mayo Clinic here in, in the state here, uh, called the Beauty Project. Uh, and they're actually looking at uh, particularly breast cancer, uh, and they're, the, the way that they're actually doing it is they're doing whole genome sequencing uh, three times, once for the patient's healthy cells before treatment, one for the tumor genome before chemotherapy and surgery, and then one for the tumor genome after <coughs> chemotherapy and surgery. Uh, they're hoping to enroll a total of 200 participants. They're looking for common mutations. So what they're doing a little bit differently is they are not doing the bioinformatic analysis that we're doing, but specifically looking for common mutations uh, that are known to exist in, in, in breast cancer and then test the effects of those <coughs> known chemotherapy agents on those tumors uh, that are put into mice. So this isn't, you know, variation, variations of this are actually now starting up around the world. And I think this is really an exciting area uh, of research uh, that clinical translational research where we're now being able to provide, uh, you know, relatively real-time feedback back to the patients uh, based on all of the technology that we now have available to us. This is just some data from the Jackson Labs where we're doing these xenografts, and you can see, uh, this is for the pathologist in the group here, you can see in this particular case, this is a patient breast tumor which has an organoid type pattern, and the same sort of pattern you can also see after it's been uh, grown up in a xenograft into mice. Uh, this is another particular case where you have sheets of polymorphic cells, again, after it's been xenograft in, in the mouse, similar histo histological profiles. Genetically, when we look at it as well, the genetics, uh, the genome seems to be relatively stable in, in these, uh, uh, in these uh, samples that we're looking at, with a few exceptions. Um, so ultimately, which uh, cancer treatment works best for you? Uh, we're hoping that uh, in these cases, you'll be able to go ahead and ask your personal mouse. So finally, um, you know, I think this is a really exciting era for, uh, for both medicine and genetics. Uh, I really believe that we're getting to a point where at some point, we are going to be sequencing everyone's genome. Uh, in some individuals, it could be at the prenatal setting. Other individuals, it could be at uh, you know at the newborn stage. Uh, and if all uh, for others, it could be when they've acquired disease, and then we need to uh, use this sort of a treatment or something similar to help them uh, with treatment. And with that, I'm just going to uh, acknowledge uh, first of all, Thousand Genomes Project because of all the work that they've done. This is just actually about probably about a half, a little more than a half of the people involved that got together at uh, Cold Spring Harbor meeting uh, last year, and uh, they provided us with the tools uh, and, and really a lot of the baseline data that makes all of, uh, this clinical sequence impossible. And this is my group at Brigham Women's Hospital uh, and with the research funding from both uh, NHGRI and, and IGMS. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we are, so they we have this for, for CMV as well. And, and the other reason, actually, you, you brought up the fact that um, we also know, for example, that we will get uh, mutations found because of the fact that um, the connection to the safe mutations are uh, frequent in hearing loss, I think, about half the cases. So uh, that's another reason why we chose this, but absolutely. In your xenograft experiments, uh, with your, your um, avatar mice versus the uh, beauty experiment, um, 
in uh, Mayo. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting differences is the fact, of course, you might have concerns that during the course of therapy, you're going to induce various mutations and changes in the genome, which may completely change your profile. Yeah. Do you have concerns in your experiment about not? Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. So I think, uh, as you know, this, uh, there have been uh, a lot of, there have been a few very good sequencing uh, papers that have come up, uh, this paper, for example, on breast cancer from Lawson Trust, that have shown that in certain cases you, there is um, uh, processes such as gene crispness, et cetera, that change the genomes. And I think that's something that we need to evaluate further. I guess the initial thing is we want to try to identify uh, the driver mutations. Uh, that doesn't mean that the subsequent mutations wouldn't have also uh, major effects on, on the effectiveness of their treatment. So um, I think that's one of the reasons why the Mayo Clinic is taking this, this time point, and I think that's a great strategy. Uh, that's something which we would probably want to look into as well, but that hasn't all been finalized in our time. Thank you. I have a question about the 1,000. Yeah. So from which cells in the body do you extract the DNA? How many cells per individual do you use? Uh -huh. So all of this DNA for the Thousand Genomes Project is from blood. And in fact, what was sequenced is from uh, lymphoblastoma cell line. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, the, the whole idea was we wanted to make available all of these resources to the entire community. And so by establishing lymphoblastoid cell lines, you can order them from Coriel and do your own studies on, uh, on these individuals. The downside of it is you have potential for cell culture artifacts, etc. Uh, and in some of those individuals, you have blood that's frozen away at the NHGRI, but very limited amounts. And therefore, if you have something spectacular that you really want to go back to the blood, uh, then you could ask the NHGRI. How many cells? I actually don't know that they're using for. I think they're uh, for a typical DNA library that they're making, they're using uh, 0.5 micrograms or 500 nanograms of DNA. Uh, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, it's approximately. Yeah. Does the CHD panel also look for production defects in the DNA? So the idea is that um, the, the patients that we're actually going to be sequencing, they're they fail the initial E1 screening test, uh, the ABR test, and then they're followed up afterwards with the second test with the audiologist. If they fail both, then we subject them to the sequencing. Aren't they just hard to see? Sorry. It's kind of hard to see. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the question was um, Is it a key production defect? The long QT. Oh, long QT. I'm sorry. Um, I actually don't know. Oh, yeah, so um, we are. So we're pre it's, my understanding is it's pretty good that when they take the tumors out of the mouse, that it's pretty clean that they're not getting mouse uh, sequences there. Um, I don't, I've never heard of any issues with mouse contamination in the sequencing. Yeah. Did you get on the development of actual DNA from the sequencing agent? Right. So, um, with the data that we have from Thousand Genomes Project, the, so the question was um, commenting on confidence of variation detection from uh, next gen sequencing. So, from Thousand Genomes Project, when we sequenced about 40 50 X coverage, we were detecting about 82% of deletions, uh, about 50% of duplications, and less than 5 to 10% of other structural deterioration. So, not that great. Um, we there are papers out there that are actually now touting that by from exome sequencing you can pick up copy number variants, and that I think that's all global. Um, that's that's not really the case. Um, people are claiming that's the case. The data that we're seeing that's not correct. Um, we estimate that probably we're going to want to sequence at least 80 x to 100 x to capture more duplication, um, and uh, even then at 100 x some areas that are very difficult to obtain, that are not accessible uh, for structural variants. The compromise for that is just like what you would do for all every 
I'm sorry, looking at pedigrees for? Well, um, in C and D. Yes. So take schizophrenia, yes. whatever. And yes. If you look at grandma, mother, and child, or yes. something like that. Are, you know, what is the engine generating the level of the engine? I see. So um, that's an area that we've touched on a little bit, but still needs a lot of work. Um, so we know that there are different, <coughs> in general, when you look at copy number variants, the vast majority of them are inherited. So they're relatively stable. We don't have a good handle of what the de novo rate of formation, with the exception of those that are uh, produced from uh, segmental duplication. So these group regions of the genome that are duplicated, they have some intervening sequences, and these duplications can uh, undergo NHR mechanisms to cause duplication deletions of the regions in between. Those are thought, uh, we believe, in general, occur at a rate of 10 to the minus 5 per locus approximately. Uh, but, uh, and there have been work done in sperm cells to try to evaluate this as well, but um, I think that's sort of where we stand right now. Is that good? Yes? John, I know you told me that you're kind of the establishment of CLIA lab as part of this. Yes, <laughs> it'd be very exciting. And so I'm wondering, within the clinical lab, mm -hmm. are you planning, let's say, for the leukemia patients, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're actually, uh, my, my hopes are that we're actually going to go straight into whole genome sequencing. Um, the prices have come down quite considerably, so that there's not a lot of difference between whole genome and exome sequencing. The, the advantage is, of course, exome sequencing, you're getting 50, 100x coverage, whereas you may be getting about 30x coverage for whole genome sequencing for maybe double the price. Um, we think, uh, it may be that we have to do a little combination of both to get all the information at a high enough accuracy. But really the push for our CLIA Diagnostic Lab for this institute is really to do genome-wide analyses. Um, something that is not being done in the rest of the institutions and providing sort of the next edge. And uh, I think that's where the future is, yeah. And the second thing is that, let's say some of the pediatric leukemia cells mm -hmm. that I'm familiar with, yes. people have actually moved from genomics back to expression analysis mm. in those, um, because you're dealing with the tissue and, and so thereby by getting the expression profile, yes. you can then work backwards, yes. actually, because regardless of whether you, somehow you're disrupting this gene. Yes. And they're more concerned with the end effects of disruption mm -hmm. to get to the target one. Um, yeah. No, I think that's a very good point. In fact, I, I agree that for, uh, the, for the sequencing that's going to be done, it can't be limited just to sequencing DNA. Um, I would envision some level of RNA-seq to occur to give you uh, transcript profiles, uh, you know, um, and, and then give you insights back to what's going on in the, you know, uh, variants that you might have missed at the genomic sequencing level. So that's almost imperative. It has to be done, and I think that's a great point. And I would actually say, so I'm, again, obviously I'm very excited about this new institute, and we'll see how far we can take it. It's going to be built. It should be finished fall of next year, and I welcome everyone here to come visit, and I'd love to be able to explore some ways that we can interact uh, between the institutions for both training uh, and learning what you guys have and, and vice versa. So um, 